What's going on, everybody? Guys, welcome to the Rec Nation. And drum roll. We have come to the last episode of Battle 360. This is episode 10 Winter Blitz Night Assaults from the Enterprise. Guys, what a journey! What a freaking journey it has been. It, it it has sparked so many conversations. You guys are so knowledgeable. Thank you for all the comments and sticking on this journey with me. We are not done with all of our various journeys we got to get to. Uh, look for the, the poll in the community post. I'll probably get to that poll next week. Um, lining up which series to vote for that we get to next. I'm only going to be juggling two series at a time. Um, currently battle 360 is one and world at war is another okay so with those major series underway it, yeah we're going to replace battle 360 with another series and i think that'll be that'll be good for like our weekend viewing um so anyway guys let's check this out i'm here for it can't believe we finally got into the last episode so without further ado let's bring it up and Ready, three, two, one, let's go. Previously on Battle 360, USS Enterprise has led the American war effort for three solid years. From Pearl Harbor to the climactic battle of Leyte Gulf. That was crazy. Her string of victories video. has earned the ship the nickname Lucky E. But this war is not over. Japan has unleashed a terrifying new weapon, suicide planes. Kamikaze attacks will bring Enterprise the highest casualties of the entire war. And the ship's fabled luck may be about to run out. That's nuts. USS Enterprise, a fighting city of steel. She is the most revered and decorated ship of World War II. On this 360 degree battlefield, where threats loom on the seas, in the skies, and in the ocean depths, the Enterprise's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the battle's all around you. Battle 360, USS Let's Enterprise, go. the Let's Empire's last stand. Let's go. January 10th, 1945, 3 a.m. A squadron of bombers and fighters launch off the deck of USS Enterprise. Commander Bill Martin asks the flyers of Enterprise to take on one of the most dangerous operations of the war. No one turns him down. He's a kind of an officer that he says, tonight we're gonna fly into hell and back and uh, you'd go right with him. For three solid years, USS Enterprise has been leading America's war in the Pacific. No other ship has seen so much combat. No other vessel has won so many victories. This ship saw all of the high points of the war against Japan. She defeated Japan, not single-handed, but she was out there in the precarious times when nobody else was out there. She may have missed a few battles, but she didn't miss many. Man. Now, three years after Pearl Harbor, Enterprise unleashes a new strategy against the Japanese Empire. Night air attacks. Three hundred miles away from Enterprise, 15 ships of a Japanese convoy run supplies to the Imperial fleet under cover of darkness. They hug the coast of what is now Vietnam. The 21 Enterprise Nightbirds spot the fat target near dawn and go to work. 
Lieutenant Man. Russ Kippen leads the attack in his torpedo bomber. He's already a hero, an experienced night fighter who led the daring attack on Truck Lagoon in 1944. Now, he sets his sights on a Japanese light cruiser. Soaring in at only 500 feet above sea level, Kippen drops both of his bombs. They bracket the cruiser, forcing her to veer off. Another bomber begins his run and hits a destroyer midship. At the same time, Hellcat fighters tear up the decks of the ships with machine gun fire. The Hellcats have a new weapon in their arsenal. High velocity rockets. Oh wow, okay. Each fighter can fire off six rockets so powerful, they gain the nickname Holy Moses. <laughs> they travel okay. at over 1,300 feet per second, with a range of over 6,000 feet, and an explosive warhead that can penetrate armor. The rockets rip from beneath the Hellcat's wings, punching holes in one of the merchant ships. Wow. When the Enterprise bombers break off the attack near dawn, three ships are sunk. Two Yo. more are damaged and heading for shore. And another two ships are dead in the water. Yo! It's been a good night. This is the new face of warfare. A trail being blazed by Enterprise and her men as they lay claim to the night. What a game changer. Remember remember in the beginning of this of this war, like the torpedo bombers with their like ten percent success rate of the bombs even or the torpedoes doing anything. You know, they were terrible. So this is just we've leveled up. We've leveled up using rockets. And, oh, this is it's it's terrifying. Um, it's terrifying to see how how the devices we use to to kill the enemy are are in have they've leveled up and it's it's nuts. This is rockets. Okay, there you go. Now we've we've brought something new to the fight. Man, remember in the beginning of this um this series how. Like night flying was just you just don't do it, especially from an aircraft uh, aircraft carrier. Obviously, from an aircraft aircraft carrier, and how like we were just learning how to do it, and it's still pretty precarious. But like that's that's it's not. I this has been insane to see the development in the tactics of the aircraft carriers and how they were implemented because you can't compare to nowadays nowadays with the ranges of some of these airplanes these jets these fighter planes on these aircraft carriers they don't even need to be near any sort of conflict they just park up around ish the middle of said ocean and they send their the the, the jets and they're like okay cool fair enough we'll get there and back not a problem but then man Enterprise was in the thick of everything. They treated that thing like a battleship almost. Two weeks before, Enterprise steamed out of Pearl Harbor on Christmas Eve. She had undergone some major renovations, including new landing lights and new planes, each equipped with the newest radar technology. Radar already allows ships to see incoming threats. But more importantly, the aircraft mounted radar gives the Allied forces a new tactical advantage. Flying at night. Oh, there you go. In addition to new technology, now Enterprise also has a new designation. She was once CV-6. Now she is CVN-6. 
and the N stood for night operations. So she becomes the first and only night operating carrier. Wow. Commander Bill Martin is the mastermind behind night fighting. But night operations has its detractors in the Navy brass. It was very controversial. They thought, why are we doing this new thing? Why are we doing night operations? We're already winning the war. Bill Martin has his own personal mission, to prove that night operations are not only viable, they are necessary. There's clearly a huge strategic advantage to be able to attack at night. If you can't find me, you can't shoot me. What are the disadvantages? Well, now your pilots have to fly a night mission, which is high stress physiologically, and then come back and land on a carrier at night. That's not easy. Yeah. Radio man Tom Watts has been training with the pilots of Enterprise in the art of flying in the dark. Planes are all blacked out. The exhaust on each side of the engines were, were covered. If you flew in formation, the guy next to you, you could look out and see his wing almost in your window there. But if flying in the dark is difficult, landing is worse. Pilots must guide themselves through the dark to their home target using only radar. Then try to land on the bucking deck of the carrier with few visual cues. All they had for night landing was a little string of lights up the center of the flight deck. It's a tough job in the daytime, but at nighttime it's really rough. I couldn't imagine that, man. But Enterprise must also operate during the day flying combat air patrol during enemy attacks and keeping her flight deck open to receive planes that are too damaged to make it back to their home carriers. Round-the-clock combat schedules go into effect. War is now a 24-hour affair. Wow. January 5th, 1945. Five days before combat begins. Enterprise meets up with its task force. There are six full-size carriers, six light carriers, battleships, destroyers, and support craft. 116 ships in all. Wow. The most powerful naval strike force the world has ever seen. The task force makes its way to the South China Sea. It is the first time that Allied forces have entered the Japanese-controlled sea since the war began. Wow. Night attack on the Japanese convoy is only the first strike. Over the next three days, Bill Martin's night group bombs Japanese held Saigon, Hong Kong, and Canton. The first strikes on these vital mainland ports. In less than two weeks, the pilots of the Big E fly 4,000 miles. Whoa sink 200,000 tons of shipping and strike at the mainland outposts of Japan's empire. The night fighters are already proving their worth. Two weeks later, Enterprise gets its biggest challenge. Target, Kyurun Harbor, Formosa. Objective, oh destroy enemy shipping and supply bases. Strategy, night attack with bombers. Wow. January 22nd, 2 a.m. Seven TBM Avengers launch into the night. Each carries two 500-pound bombs, six five-inch rockets, one pilot, one electronics officer, and one radar operator. It's not an easy position. Mm. We had to navigate where we wanted to go. 
Let's use radar. Let's drop bombs. Let's drop flares. Bill Martin personally leads three planes in the Formosa strike. The other section is led once again by Lieutenant Russ Kippen. They fly due west for 212 miles, then northwest for another 100 miles, until they reach the island of Formosa. The radar man picks up the pattern of Kurun Harbor on the radar scopes at 4.30 a.m. The attack begins. Wow. The TBM's targets are the outer and inner harbors, fat with supply ships. Land-based targets are vital oil tanks and a small arms factory. But those who fly by radar can die by radar. Japanese radar picks up the incoming attackers and anti-aircraft fills the sky. Nice. Bill Martin has a simple plan based on his intimate knowledge of radar operations. He climbs to 8,000 feet and flies toward the inner harbor guided by radar. Japanese anti-aircraft point toward him. What the enemy doesn't know is that Russ Kippen is flying 8,000 feet directly below him, so that both planes show up as a single blip on the Japanese radar. Oh my god. As the anti-aircraft targets the high planes, Kippen's Avengers soar in undetected. <laughs> the flight group makes three runs using the same technique, dropping their bombs on tankers and warehouses. One Avenger unleashes its rockets on a small arms factory. It makes a satisfying fireworks display. But as the flight group veers back home, three planes are unaccounted for. Last I heard of Kippen, he said that searchlights were bothering him. Then he didn't hear anything more about him. Commander Martin tried to call Kippen and no answer, so eventually he had to come back by himself. They lost three planes. So uh, that was a big blow to our squadron. Mm. Despite their losses, the night bombers of Enterprise keep up the pressure on the enemy with midnight attacks on the Japanese home islands. And even on Tokyo itself. It's crazy. Reached out and touched them. And now that the Japanese know they can be hit, they become more ferocious in their defenses and more desperate in their attacks. So for the Japanese, they're turning up the intensity. They're fighting more savagely. They're resisting with more and more stubbornness. Nowhere is Japan's desperate newfound ferocity more evident than at the tiny strip of Pacific land called Iwo Jima. Oh, man. It's a small island, but America needs it as an air base to launch B-29 bombers to strike the Japanese mainland. And the Japanese have no intention of giving it up. On February 19th, the U.S. invasion of Iwo Jima begins. Wow, look at that, man. While Marines storm the beaches and fight inch by inch, Enterprise fighters will keep an average of 50 flights over the island every 24 hours, non-stop for seven full days. Wow. A feat unequal in the war. But the results of this punishing drill speak for themselves. On sea, on land, and in the air. There was not one successful enemy air attack on the Marines 
or the beachhead all the time we were providing combat air patrol wow. at Iwo Jima from the 21st of February until the 10th of March. The iconic flag raising actually signals the beginning of the Iwo invasion, not the end. But it's a signal that the Enterprise and her pilots can leave the battle area for a much needed rest. It will not be a long one. Man, I couldn't imagine like, I couldn't imagine how exhausting that is as, as a, as a, as a fighter pilot, like you're, you're working on adrenaline for seven days straight. Like you need, you need to crash. You need, I mean, that, sorry for the terrible place pun. You need to, you need to unplug for a sec. You know, and and I bet you they slept like crazy after they all got back. I know that's a stupid statement to say, but man, but how amazing is that? There was no like aerial attack on the invading force because of the 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 constant twenty four hour flights of the of the the fighter planes. That's that's amazing. Like, that's like I feel like. The U.S. finally showed up. You know, they, this is the first time in like U.S. fashion. Like we got the air, we got the water, and we're and we're pushing on the on the beach, all like within itself. Like that. That's that's pretty. So far in this in this Battle 360 series, this is the first time it feels like the 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 American thing. Right, I know that sounds kind of stupid, but it's like, but that's what I mean. It's like everything is is locked down, um, and you worry about the the ground forces uh, gaining ground there. So, March eighteenth, five seventeen a.m. Enterprise floats near Iwo Jima as the first flights return from their night bombing raids. Enterprise radar spots a formation of aircraft 75 miles away and closing fast. Mm. But they can't tell if the planes are friend or foe. At 7.30 a.m., the men of Enterprise see the formation themselves. It looks like an American squadron. A single plane breaks away from the group 500 feet above sea level and begins a shallow glide toward Enterprise. We watched it coming, and she looked just like a TBF. Nobody fired at it. All we could see was the, the front, and she kept coming and coming and coming. But at 200 feet away, the horrifying truth hits. And suddenly, we realized this wasn't a friendly airplane. Oh my and God. literally was flying just a few feet above our flight deck. It's a Judy dive bomber. The Big E's 20 millimeter guns rattle out their response, but it is too late. Only a few feet above the flight deck, the Judy opens her belly door and drops a 550 pound bomb. I thought, oh God, that's the end of us. I got blown up in the air, came down on my rear end, and I heard this voice saying, Sir, can we abandon the battery? The bomb is down here. And there was this big, ugly bomb right beside one of our batteries. The bomb miraculously has crashed through the flight deck, bounces back up and skitters across the deck without going off. White. All these Marines with their white faces, big, big eyes, staring at it. All eyes are on the terrifying object. Until young sailor Pedro Sandoval can't stand it any longer. I look around, trying to see which way to get rid of it. So some of my friends helped me roll the bomb all the way to the fantail and drop it off the flight deck into the water. We didn't know nothing about where the bomb was armed or not. 
We just went out there to get rid of it. Wow! It is a direct... What, bro? Oh, my God. This is like brown pants moment? And it's a dud? Oh, my God. And that pilot was like, they think I'm one of them. They think I'm one of them. This is weird. This I, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm about to. I'm about to rip a hole in this ship. Drops a big old dud on the deck. No way, man. We didn't know nothing about whether the bomb was on him or not. We just went out there to get rid of it. It is a direct hit at point blank range, and it turns out to be a dud. <laughs> Lucky Enterprise, once again, earns her nickname. Oh my god, bro. But incredibly, the war is about to get even closer to Enterprise. No way. The day after the dud bomb strike, Enterprise floats in formation. At the far side of the task group, carrier USS Franklin launches fighter strikes against the Japanese harbor of Kobe. At 7 a.m., an enemy dive bomber plunges from the sky. It hits Franklin with two 550-pound bombs, both fore and aft. Wow. Franklin is not as lucky as Enterprise was the day before. The bombs are devastating, causing gas planes to explode, sending fires throughout the ship, blowing men overboard. 20-year-old oh Edward Suto has seen action on Enterprise for over a year but he has never seen anything like this. We were there when she got hit. She had over 40 explosions. It scared you. Wow. From over 10 miles away, the men of Enterprise can literally feel a series of thudding blasts as their bombs and torpedoes self-detonate in the fire. It's reminiscent of the damage that Big E took on in Santa Cruz. Man. Only this is worse, much worse. And I don't know how long it went on, but it was just hard to believe that a boat could go through such agony and still survive. Wait, she didn't sink? 724 are killed and 265 are wounded. Enterprise hurries to the rescue of the listing carrier. Wow. Enterprise patrols fly close cover round the clock to protect the wounded giant as she makes her way to the American base at Ulithi. 1,300 miles away. The ship is under tow, but incredibly, Franklin's engines are repaired within 24 hours. No carrier has ever received such massive damage wow. and survived. Wow. She begins to steam under her own power into the Navy repair port. When a ship comes into port, they generally go to quarters, which means the sailors line the deck and standing at attention, so they're looking as ship shape as possible. But when the Franklin went in to that port, the Franklin had this little knot of men, it was all that were left, standing rigidly at attention. Mm. And that's all it was, but they were a proud looking bunch. As the American fleet gets closer to Japan, the enemy strikes are more deadly. The Enterprise crew watches the gallant survivors of Franklin, and they know this could have been them. The next day, it will be Enterprise's turn. March 20th, Enterprise returns to her base of operations off Okinawa. They expect an attack from the same flyers who hit Franklin. They are not disappointed. The initial wave of Japanese dive bombers appears at 4 p.m. The first assault comes from a diving Judy. 2,000 feet above Enterprise, the bomber drops its 500-pound payload. The bomb travels the entire length of the Big E's deck before it hits the sea less than 50 feet from the starboard bow. Wow. It explodes in the ocean, sending jets of water over the flight deck. At 424, another Judy begins its dive. The ship's guns open up, taking her out just 500 feet away. But the Big E's fabled luck may be starting to run out. As the Judy dives, 
Enterprise is hit by two five-inch exploding shells from one of her own ships. We got a lot of damage from our own anti-aircraft fire. And you can't really help that. It's the ship in line on the other side oh where that stuff luck. The American shells hit the Big E's 40 millimeter gun tub, killing seven men and oh wounded my 30. God, man. The explosion sets fire to a nearby Hellcat. Its ammo ignites. At the same moment, another Judy dives heading straight toward the deck. At 500 feet, she drops her package. The bomb explodes on the port deck. Enterprise is on fire. The whole island structure had flames going through it. And our platform that we worked off of was just like a griddle with a fire underneath it. Damage control leaps into action, spraying fire foam across the flaming deck. Enterprise carries a damage control crew of 300, spread out in small groups throughout the ship. Wow. The Big E's damage control chief, John Monroe, had been wise enough to secretly requisition several times as quota of fire foam while back in Pearl. <laughs> now it's paying off. Within 30 minutes, the fires raging on deck are under control. 15 minutes after that, all fires are out. Wow. Enterprise guns continue to hammer at the sky. They shoot down the last bomber at 5.10 p.m. The skies are clear once again. Whoa. With the flames smothered, it's clear that the bomb damage is surprisingly minor. And Enterprise is left with a strange souvenir of the attack. The fuselage of a Japanese dive bomber is lodged in the hull of the ship. We look down, and the engine is stuck in the side of the ship. And of course, the, the, the wave action of our ship going 20, 25 knots, that plane torn up a little bit more all the time. That's the nuts. Enterprise has been hit, but she is still going strong. Her luck has held so far. Yo. What? As Enterprise. That's it. It. it I, I feel like. We've touched on this a couple times is, is the the friendly fire situation at in these sea battles, like where they're like, it's kind of inevitable and it's it's like a given, which is which is it's wild to say like friendly fire is a given. But I guess at that time it. You know, you had to shoot down the plane. And if you're if you're tracking a plane through the air and you're trying to get you're trying to shoot because you have to shoot in front of you have to lead the 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 target a lot. And I'm assuming a ton. If you are if you are trying to track a plane and shoot it out of the air, you have to put your sights. Probably if this is your sight, you're trying to sight this plane coming in. And so you're staying a good distance away. So if you're trying to predict where it's going, more than anything, that that the Enterprise probably popped up on that guy's sights, and he was like, Sh "Shit!" And he's already sent he's already sent his rounds um, towards the Enterprise at that point before he could stop. That's man. <laughs> oh God! Guys, heads dude. for the Navy repair base at Ulithi Atoll. The Japanese are now creating a far more deadly fighting force. One that yearns only for death. Called Kamikaze, the Divine Wind. They are a potent threat. The first suicide attacks back in 1942 may have been ad hoc decisions by wounded fighter pilots. But by late 1944, they have become Japanese policy. Wow. Vice Admiral Takajiro Onishi is the mastermind of the Kamikaze squadrons. Onishi realizes that his poorly trained, under-equipped Air Corps may have one final force multiplier. Suicide strikes. Now in April, Allied Intelligence reports that Onishi has assembled an entire force of 400 aircraft of every type and age, each packed with as much explosives as possible. It is Japan's final defense of its homeland. Sometimes the kamikazes are portrayed as desperate, um, as fanatical. And I don't necessarily think that they should be construed in such a way. Of course, yes, the Japanese were at that point in a desperate situation. But 
it has to be construed as the Japanese using a serious weapon, a serious and deadly weapon. To the crewmen of Enterprise, the kamikaze are confusing, inexplicable, terrifying. It made your skin kind of crawl. You didn't know what was going on in their minds. You didn't know if they were going to do that again. It changed the whole complexion of the war. You can't rationalize. We're not coming from the same place. It doesn't make any sense. It's pretty scary. The Japanese are willing to sacrifice their best, and the tactics are working. Wow. In March, America launches an assault on the islands closest to Japan. It is the final act of the long Pacific War. And like any great stage drama, the last act is the most spectacular mm. and the deadliest. Target, Okinawa. Objective, take and hold the islands as a staging ground for the final invasion of Japan itself. Strategy, support the army in marine invasion and fly protection missions over the half million allied fighting men attacking the island. The invasion begins April 1st. It will last 92 days. Enterprise has a crucial role as part of an allied fleet of 1,300 ships. Wow. It is the largest battle of the Pacific War, an invasion bigger than Normandy. In light of kamikaze fears, Enterprise increases her combat air patrol from 15 to 24 planes. April 11th, 1945, at 1.30 p.m., the first of the dreaded kamikaze force makes its long-awaited appearance. Radar reports incoming bogies 80 miles out. Enterprise begins her standard evasive pattern, its outlying ships tightening their protective circle. Speed increased to 25 knots, all eyes on the horizon. At 2.05, the first Zero dives out of the sky, aiming for the nearby carrier, Essex. Suddenly, it changes its target and plummets straight toward the Big E. They're diving at a pretty fast rate of speed. They always look like they're heading right for the bridge of your nose. All guns open fire. The day's first kamikaze smashes into the sea only 500 yards to starboard. Wow. But seconds later, a kamikaze dive bomber drops out of the sky, dead astern. It is the worst possible position for the Enterprise, preventing her side guns from taking aim. Enterprise swings around to provide firepower. Sailors manning her port 40 millimeters open up. The kamikaze keeps coming as the 40s keep up their onslaught. Oh it is God. a deadly duel to the finish. I can honestly say what must have been going through his head as a kamikaze pilot's coming at him, shooting at him at the same time, and he knows that he's got to take that bird out of the air before it gets to his ship. You got to stand your ground. You can focus on the task at hand. To take him out, to protect you and your buddies. Oh my God. The duel ends when the bomber hits the hull at full speed. The kamikaze attack ruptures eight fuel tanks and floods the torpedo blister. Surprisingly, there are no casualties. Wow. And as damage control gets to work, the attacks continue. At 3 p.m., another dive bomber is shot down only 25 feet off the bow. But as she hits the water, her bomb goes off, sending flaming fragments onto the deck of Enterprise. A Hellcat still in the catapult bursts into flames. Damage control moves quickly and catapults the flaming fighter into the sea. Another kamikaze begins its run and is shot down. Then another. Dude. And another. By this is... Oh my god, this is insane. Like, could you imagine? Oh my goodness. Essentially, these are guided guided rockets these are guided bombs manually driven bombs like 
that's terrifying. Like, you have to shoot these guys out of the air or they're going to hit you. Period. Period. That's... Oh, 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 this is terrifying, man. So, I didn't know... I See, I thought kamikaze uh, fighters, pilots, were... Um, it was, like, throughout the throughout the war. But this is saying it's more along the lines... Sorry, guys. It's more along the lines of towards the end. Towards the end of the war, when things got desperate... Is when um, is when the kamikazes came out. Nightfall. Six kamikaze assaults have been foiled. Enterprise has been hit. Five men have been wounded. But the ship's famous luck has held. Mm. Enterprise heads to the navy base at Ulithi Island to repair the bomb damage. When she returns to the battleground off Okinawa, the war has changed. On May 8, 1945, the war in Europe is over. The Nazi menace has been put to rest. And people across America cheer and celebrate. But in the Pacific, there is no end in sight. Enterprise steams back to Okinawa, where the brutal battle is entering its eighth relentless week. Wow. That's Evening, May 12, 1945. 16 torpedo bombers take off into the dark from the Big E's flight deck. Bill Martin intends to put the night bomber experiment to the ultimate test. Target, the airfields in Kyushu, Sasebo, and Nagasaki. Okay. Objective, stop the kamikaze attacks. Strategy, suppression bombing. The Nightbirds intend to hammer the airfields all night long, preventing the Japanese from even stepping outside to prepare the morning's kamikaze flights. 350 miles away, on the island of Kyushu, Japanese radar-controlled searchlights pick out the attackers as they come in. The Avengers dodge and weave through anti-aircraft, buzzing the airfields, strafing parked aircraft, bombing hangars, rocketing power plants, and forcing the Japanese off their own airfields. The Avengers keep up the pressure for three-hour periods. Then they are relieved by another crew for the next three hours. Wow. The Japanese crews cannot even step outside. As the first light of dawn breaks on the horizon, the Avengers peel off to be replaced by the morning fighter patrol. Night bombers have a disadvantage. In the dark, they cannot determine the actual damage they have inflicted. But above the American fleet anchored off the coast of Okinawa, the results are clear by midday. Not a single Japanese plane is seen in the sky. What? Not a single attack on any American ship in the task force for the entire day. Wow. And that proved why our night operations were so valuable. Throughout the night, we scraped and hammered the Japanese airfields. So the very next day, there was not one single Japanese airplane that even got into flight and attacked one of our ships. Bill Martin has proven the deadly effectiveness of radar-guided night operations. Martin's night operations experiment has worked. Yeah. Two days later, the exhausted night patrols land aboard Enterprise after another successful raid on the home islands. It is 5.30 a.m., May 14th. For the round-the-clock warriors of the Big E, the day is just beginning. We'd come back in about 5.30 and about 6 o'clock or so. We'd crawl in our bunks and we'd get some sleep. And here comes the kamikaze. The uh, five-inch are open up. That would wake us up. Oh so my then God. we'd sit up in our bunks. quiet. Then we crawl back in our bunk and try to go back to sleep. <laughs> At 6.10 a.m., a new set of bogies are detected by radar. Twelve groups, several miles out. Wow. The Enterprise crew members prepare for another kamikaze assault. Within minutes, the first suicide plane begins its run, headed directly for the center of the Big E's deck. Enterprise's guns open up. To the crew's surprise, 
The kamikaze takes no defensive action and is quickly shot down. The kamikaze pilots are barely trained, raw recruits, easy prey for Enterprise's seasoned gunners. Within a half hour, five kamikazes are shot from the sky. But at 6.50 a.m., a single zero begins to tail the Big E, staying out of range, darting in and out of the fat, white, cumulus clouds. At 6.56, as Enterprise swings around in evasive action, the Zero sees its opportunity. From dead astern, the Japanese fighter begins its dive. Enterprise keeps turning, bringing her guns into play. We whirled around. One of the fighters, single plane, Boy, everybody unloaded on him. The Zero is taking lots of lead, wobbling in its advance, yet still it comes. Now the 20s are firing directly across Enterprise's decks, and it looks like the ship's luck will hold. He flew down our port side, up about 200 feet, I'd say. And I thought, you know, he's gonna overshoot. Thank God he missed us. Then, to the shock of all on board, the Zero rolls left, turns upside down, and perfectly, elegantly, dives straight down into the ship's number one elevator. The largest explosion in the ship's storied history shakes her from bow to stern. Five decks below, the Zero's 500-pound bomb goes off with such power that the entire flight elevator flies straight up into the air. A photograph taken from the nearby USS Washington captures the astonishing moment Whoa. where the explosive power of a single kamikaze rockets a 15-ton elevator over 400 feet straight up. That's... Started to get up. All this stuff started coming back down, pieces of flight deck and beams, and I don't know what all had been blown up in the air. It seemed like forever that it was coming down on top of us. Like a knife to the heart, Enterprise has been hit as never before. Fire fills the elevator shaft and hangars. The flight deck is blasted and buckled. The forward guns are gone. The gasoline system is destroyed. Men are blown overboard, and 2,000 tons of water begins to pour in through the wounded ship's hull. The mighty Enterprise lists seven feet, a wow. sitting duck for the next kamikazes. Damage control goes into high gear with practiced expertise from a thousand drills, putting out fires, rescuing wounded men, trying to save the ship. The surviving gunners look to the sky to fend off the next attacks. Thirteen men are killed, sixty-eight wounded, wow. and eight are thrown overboard. Mm. When the dust settles, so to speak, uh, and you call off the numbers, and Walter Kyle's missing. Nineteen-year-old Marine Walter Kyle has manned a gun on Enterprise for over a year. There is no sign of him amid the destruction and his gun was pretty much closest to the explosion. The barrel was bent and so on. We figured he must have gone over the side. Kyle has survived the explosion by jumping overboard. When I hit the water, and then uh, when I got up, I started swimming a short distance, I saw this huge wreckage and they went toward it. Kyle climbs to safety on the floating remains of the ruined flight deck elevator. Wow. He finds two other soaked sailors. He is eventually rescued by a destroyer and returned to the Big E. When Kyle returns, he finds the once mighty carrier is now a smoking wreck. Mm. Damage control has done its best, but there is a gaping hole where the elevator once stood. The ship lists with holes blasted in the hull. Fires have damaged her planes. As the wounded giant limps off the battlefield, the repair crews assess the damage. It is not good news. 
With a missing flight elevator and a buckled deck, launching and landing planes is impossible. She's an aircraft carrier who can't launch aircraft. Oh my god. In nearly four years of war, the Big E has survived multiple attacks from air, sea, and beneath the waves. It took just one pilot with suicidal intent and brilliant flying skills to do what the rest of the Japanese Navy could never do. Take Enterprise out of the war. That's nuts, man. The wounded Enterprise must return home for repairs. Not just to Pearl Harbor, but to the States. Bremerton, Washington. That was the end of the war for us. We headed to leave because the war was still going on, but we, we could not operate. Not the condition of the ship. June 6th, 1945. One year to the day since the Normandy invasion. USS Enterprise steams into her home port for major repairs. For the next three months, the crew of Enterprise remains landlocked, some taking shore leave, some visiting home, some continuing the daily tasks necessary to maintain this 32,000 ton steel city. Enterprise is still in dry dock in August when the Japanese surrender. Lloyd and I went into a bar in Bremerton to have a beer and uh, somebody came running in and said, the war's over, the war's over. And I'll tell you, it was a, a, a great feeling. Mm. In Tokyo, representatives of the emperor signed the unconditional surrender on the deck of the battleship Missouri. Man. On the day of the surrender, Kamikaze Admiral Onishi writes a note of apology to the 4,000 pilots he sent to their deaths. Then he commits ritual suicide. The long war is over. The men of Enterprise breathe a sigh of relief, as does the rest of America. Man. Most of the tired heroes just want to go home and start normal life again. Sailor Edward Sudo is caught on newsreel film. There's a picture of on the victory. You see, you see them all coming off, and they're all firemen and uh, seamen. It showed Helen coming up from the right, and then I come from the left, and we meet and we grabbed each other and we hugged and we kissed. No. Then we walk off into the sunset. <laughs> The war is over, That's... but the carrier Enterprise is about to face her biggest challenge, and it may ultimately destroy her. What? In October 1945, the Big E is back in the water, powering into New York Harbor for a national celebration for the victorious U.S. Navy, with Enterprise as the guest of honor. And yeah, that was a great celebration. She welcomed over 200,000 visitors to the ship for a week. And then uh, they had the big parade down Avenue of the Americas. And uh, the Enterprise Navy Band was selected to lead that parade. Thousands of curious awesome. onlookers come aboard the legendary ship there to read her posted scorecard. Wow. 20 service stars, one for every major battle, 911 aircraft destroyed, 71 ships sunk, the most successful and the most decorated ship up to that point in the history of the U.S. Navy. In May 1946, a year after the war is over, Enterprise is back in dry dock and in limbo. The U.S. Navy looks to the future, and the future is jets. In fact, some of the first experimental jet fighters flew combat missions in World War II. Yet the Big E's decks and structure are not large enough or strong enough to support jet warfare. Oh, man. She is an honored warrior whose wars are behind her. The question remains, what to do with her? The U.S. Secretary of the Navy suggests that Enterprise become a floating museum 
calling her the one vessel that best symbolizes the Navy in the war. Admiral Bull Halsey leads an effort to raise money for an Enterprise Museum, but it is not to be. The Big E, greatest warrior of the Pacific, is finally sold for scrap. They couldn't save it to sell it for scrap, that hurt. Oh. I cried. Underway for the last time, the USS Enterprise moves from Brooklyn Navy Yard to Kearney, New Jersey, and the wreckers. Thus is marked the failure of Admiral Bull Halsey's campaign to have the Big E preserved as a national shrine. Obsolete in the jet and atomic age, the one vessel that most nearly symbolized the role of the Navy in the Pacific War heads meekly for the scrap heap. Oh my God, dude. Enterprise veteran Edward Sudo watches the progress of the destruction over many months as he goes to work every day at the Ford factory in New Jersey. I was watching dismantling piecemeal, and I was watching clear, clear down to the hull where they had everything cut away except just the bottom part of the ship. Ah, it's heartaching. To some veterans of Enterprise, the process is a crime. To others, it is a sad inevitability. I've seen what goes on on these sideshow ships, and I, I don't like it. It's, you know, kids running about and screaming, uh, selling of candy and ice cream, and uh, so on. And it all seems to me just degrading. I uh, always felt that the Enterprise was something truly noble, uh, a great ship, and uh, I didn't want to see her tied up. And some say the scrapping of the Enterprise is a testimony to her own success. At the end of World War II, this country got down to the business of being in peace. That we literally beat our swords into plowshares at the end of the Second World War. That really says a lot about our history. So we may not have the USS Enterprise today that we can go visit as a floating museum. But I think even, even that in and of itself illustrates the transition that occurred in this country. That's a tough one. Enterprise may be gone, mm. but her memories live on. I still love USS Enterprise CB6. I think the Enterprise still has a personality today. It's, of course, gone to the scrap heap many years ago, but it's still living on in the hearts and minds of so many of us folks that are still living today. Some of her valiant warriors carry a piece of Enterprise in their hearts. Some carry a piece of Enterprise elsewhere. <laughs> I, I still got a bag full of small pieces of shrapnel. Just, you know, that's my uh, part of the Enterprise. I'll carry me all the rest of my life. Every time I get a chest x-ray, it lights up. <laughs> oh my God. Many of the men of Enterprise remained in the military. Norman Dusty Cleese, one of the heroes of Midway, went on to a long Navy career, retiring as captain. Fighter pilot Donald Flash Gordon attained the rank of captain. James Jigdog Ramage served in Korea and Vietnam and retired as a rear admiral. And Vincent Dupois of Fighting Squadron 6 attained the rank of rear admiral and in 1961 became the first captain of the new Enterprise, no America's way. first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. And even now, more than 60 years later, stories of valor from the Enterprise are still coming to light. At a reunion of Enterprise veterans in 2001, Walter Kyle finally revealed the true story of what happened on the Enterprise's last day of action, a tale he had kept secret for six decades. Wow. We were sitting around talking about things that happened, instances and so forth, and I or somebody said, Walter, Boy, you were lucky, and Walter, for the first time, started talking about this thing. May 14th, 1945. Walter Kyle scrambles onto floating wreckage after Enterprise has been hit, where he finds two soaked sailors. One of them said, there's another guy, third guy, he said, bring him over. And he said, can't. And of course, I asked why. The guy, he said, it's hurt. 
Kyle swims to the rescue of the wounded man, Bob Riesland, while the floating wreckage drifts away. So the guy said, I'm wounded, I'm going to die anyway, so just go ahead and get back onto the elevator and, and leave me drown. And he wouldn't do that. Kyle refuses to leave the wounded sailor, staying with him for hours until they are finally rescued by a destroyer. Mm. Kyle returns to Enterprise the next day, more interested in a hot shower and hot meal than a medal. The wounded sailor recovers in Enterprise's sick bay, and Kyle tells no one about his own heroism. He never said anything about the sailor. He just said he'd been going overboard, and that's all he said. We sat there enthralled and astonished to learn what had transpired. We said, Walter, we never heard that story. Kyle's shipmates soon had a surprise in store. We went to the Marine Corps, and I think I was the only officer left at that time. So I applied for a medal. On May 15, 2004, Walter Kyle is called down to the field during a game at Miller Stadium in Milwaukee and receives the Navy and Marine Corps medal for his heroic self-sacrifice six decades earlier. No one was more surprised than Walter Kyle. I thought that was, that was done and it was over with in his history. Because you remember it was so 50, 59 years had passed. And it, it, it never occurred to me that they'd do anything. Man. Enterprise's spirit lives on. The story of USS Enterprise is the story of World War II. Uh, From her hands during the first attack on Pearl Harbor. to the final battle of the Pacific at Okinawa. This ship was there for everything. But Enterprise's heroic actions were simply a reflection of the heroes who sailed. Come on. The last of a generation who literally saved our nation by risking everything. I didn't see any glamor in it at all. All I saw was a lot of destruction, a lot of bad things. There's nothing glamorous about war. But this country's worth fighting for. That's why we do it. A lot of people come up to me now and say, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. You know, if it wasn't for those guys, we wouldn't be here. We climbed on the backs of their sacrifice. Their history is my tradition. And without the sacrifices that they made, I wouldn't even be here to fight. USS Enterprise was one of the greatest weapons in the arsenal of democracy. A fierce and deadly machine whose purpose was to win a devastating war. But to her men, the Big E was less of a weapon than a home. It was like a big mother hen or something to me. You know, he'd go out on 300 mile searches and, and come back and here's a little beacon f flickering and he'd home in on that beacon and get back aboard. You know, it was just, uh, just our home it was taken care of us. Man. Oh. Enterprise yeah. may disappear and her men may die, but she is still one of the most decorated, most valiant, and fighting as ships in U.S. history. An enterprise and her band of brothers will remain as beacons of valor, sacrifice, and grit, as long as her tales are told, as long as there are Americans who remember. That is, man, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what a, what a series, what an end. I don't know. Man, like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that happened. You know, good on them. You know, I feel like nobody in in the military, no one that has signed up or taken that oath is thinking about medals at all. That's the furthest thing away from from your mind, that you don't do it for that ever. Um, and so the fact that, these guys, after hearing that story, put in for 
a medal six like what is it 50 or 60 years later like dude legend like it just it's they who said i think it was within the series is like you guys won this medal i'll wear it and that's just kind of that it's it's he saved a, another sailor's life and that's that was touching and it was it this story is almost it's it's heartbreaking at the same time because you see this this magnificent boat this magnificent vessel turn to scrap but on the same in this within the same breath what what else were you going to do with it you know like floating museum i i could understand <laughs> i can i can get on that level of okay it's just a floating museum it's just tied down for no reason you know um during that age we didn't need that that aircraft carrier which is which is crazy to think about that that was home and that played such a massive role in this country's history just to see it scrapped it's just like i i wouldn't like it's like i wouldn't be opposed to it but i don't don't ask me how i'm doing after you know what i mean it's like i understand but i can't watch this i don't want to know anything about this you know so guys phenomenal series that we just wrapped up make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel if you haven't if you haven't i have to put it out there for everyone guys who look um next week we will be we will be uploading uh not uploading hold on guys we will be getting to a poll of where we go next with our second with our second series okay because world at war is mad long we're going to be trying to get through those uh, two videos a week, Wednesdays and Sundays on Rumble. Um, so, so we're gonna be wrapping that up in a probably by the end of the year. We'll be wrapping that up, uh, and we'll hopefully we'll be knee deep in another series by then. All right, guys. Anything more than two series, I think that would just be that. I'm we got to work together on this thing. Even though I wish I could just hit play and absorb everything that's out there at one time uh that's just not a possibility anyway guys keep the comments coming you guys are all legends thank you for rocking with me thank you for rocking with the channel guys for those of you that have been part of the premieres of this you guys are absolute legends thank you for just being a part of the community not just subscribing to the channel there's a massive difference the community we, we're building here is such a breath of fresh air it's such a good loving community and i don't want this to go anywhere so i will fight for this community tooth and nail I promise you that guys anyway guys much love make sure you unplug do something legendary and i will see you all in the next video later guys